A lot of people are mouth breathers. And as time goes by, every time I go, I don't know, to a park or I see, start seeing kids out in the supermarket and I see a lot, a lot of people mouth breathing. Every single day I see more people than I used to see before. Or maybe I wasn't paying attention before, but nowadays I see a lot of people mouth breathing. Mouth breathing might seem like, okay, what's the deal? What's the problem? It is a big problem. And it is a big problem, especially if it starts when we are kids. We need to remember that respiration is something that is very important and very necessary for the body. When we breathe, we take in oxygen from the air. The air goes into our lungs. Then it makes a switch in between the part where, we, where you have the air. Then the oxygen particles get in to the blood vessel that is circulating all over the lungs. Why does it happen? Because it gets in, then it goes back to the heart and the heart starts pumping because every single cell in the body needs oxygen. Once the cell gets the oxygen, then it creates CO2, carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide gets back through all the venous system and it comes back to the lungs. So every time that we get oxygen in, a particle of CO2 comes out, and then we breathe out through our expiration. We breathe out air with CO2. And this is the normal process in which we breathe. Of course, we can breathe through our nose and we can breathe through our mouth. But the normal thing, it's not breathing through our mouth. So what happens when we compare people that breathe through the nose and people that breathe chronically through the mouth? And we're going to see point by point, and we are going to see the differences. I'm going to tell you at the end some of the things that you need to be focusing on, that you need to be taking into account what to do and from where to start, and how to talk to your physician and try to see which are the things that probably you might be paying attention more or less in order to be breathing better. So which are the problems then? Problem number one is going to be you're going to have a dry mouth. Having a dry mouth could be a problem for a lot of people and also the consequences of having a dry mouth could be even having problems of, of getting ulcers in your mouth. When we have a dry mouth, my, I don't know, my tongue can stick in the inner part of my cheek and then I could get an ulcer. I could get an ulcer in any single part of my mouth. Having a dry mouth could even change the microbiome inside of my mouth, the balance of the good bacteria of all the microorganisms that I have in my mouth, and it could even predispose a person of having oral cavities. The other thing is by mouth breathing, we could get a lot of problems in my tonsils. So my tonsils could be more predisposed of getting more infections because I'm breathing more, I'm changing my microbiota, but I'm also getting more, more microorganisms and more particles that the, the hair and the mucus inside of my nose could be capable of blocking them now in my mouth, everything is coming completely directly and it could predispose more of getting more infections. It could also predispose more of being more irritated. Just by irritation, just by inflammation, when I get mouth breathing, I could get laryngitis, like the one I have right now. I was playing at the beach in the middle of the winter. I was playing with my kids and I got a little bit of a, a, of a sore throat because I was playing for a long time during the afternoon and now I have a sore throat after breathing probably through my mouth while I was playing. It could also predispose for having more respiratory problems. Respiratory problems in a bunch of different conditions. Mostly when kids have any predisposing asthma or any predisposure of having bronchoconstriction or any similar condition. When I have something like what I have right now, let's say a kid has asthma. When a kid has asthma, it is more predisposed of getting a more severe reaction in his lungs, in his trachea, in all of the bronchi. It is more predisposed. What happens if I get cold exposure? for a longer period of time. Then the irritation is going to be bigger and then the triggering of that constriction is going to be higher. Some people say, oh, be careful when you're cold because you might get a cold. No, no, no. You don't get a cold from being cold. You might get an irritation of your throat by being in a cold weather. And that irritation could produce pain, could produce phlegm, could produce a lot of things, but you are not infected. You might get a higher predisposition of getting an infection now that it's irritated. Getting a cold, it's something that it's transmitted by an infection, by a microorganism, and being irritated by cold exposure, it's something that it's completely 
different. But when you are mouth breathing, you might get more complications through asthma or any other respiratory condition, especially in kids. Something else that I see a lot is that people, when people are mouth breathers, they, they could be mouth breathers during the day, but they can also be mouth breathers at night. When you are a mouth breather at night, you get more predisposure of getting what we call sleep apnea. When you have more irritation, when all of the tissues inside of your mouth in the in the lower part of your mouth, in the back of your throat, when everything is bigger and irritated, people start having problems because when we are laying down, the tongue goes to the back. That blockage of the entrance of air when you are, when you are trying to breathe during the night, it's going to cause your lungs not to get enough oxygen. When you don't have enough oxygen, your heart is going to be working more in those times in which you are not getting enough oxygen. When you get that, you might predispose your heart every single night by this complication, day by day, to having a lot of heart conditions, starting by hypertension, but you can also get con congestive heart failure after a lot of years by having this. But if this starts since you're little, since you're a kid, then all the heart problems related by sleep apnea could start early in life. So this is something that we really need to take into account. And the other thing is when people are mouth breathers, especially at a young age, the development of the lower maxilla of the mandible is not going to be appropriate. You can see in this picture how mouth breathers don't develop all the protrusion adequately, everything on their mandible. So when you get that, all the problems related with speech, all the problems with swallowing, it could even predispose more to getting more infections, all the problems with the, the relationship with the neck. And there are a lot of things related more than just the aesthetic part. If you wanna see it in the aesthetic part, of course, the aesthetic is going to be completely different and this could be a real problem for, for some people because they don't develop all, all the facial characteristics and make a person look completely different. There are also people that need implants in their mandible in order to get a full development because they didn't do it while, while they were little, while they were growing. So this could be a real challenge and a real problem for a lot of people. So what are we going to do? Now we know that it's a problem. What are we going to do? We need to evaluate people. I need you to pay attention to this. We need to go and see the root cause, which is the source. Where is the problem. We cannot keep on fixing things by just the consequence. Oh, you get sleep apnea? I'm gonna do a surgery. I'm gonna take out your tonsils. Why? Is there really a problem with the tonsils or there is something else? Is there something that is related with, um, I don't know, someone was born with a bigger tongue and we need to do something about it or we don't? Is someone who is allergic, chronically allergic? Is someone that has chronic rhinitis and chronic sinusitis and maybe chronic dermatitis? What's going on? And I want you to pay attention to this. The first thing that I want you to see is if you have chronic allergies. If you think that this is something in which you produce a lot of mucus, a lot of phlegm, and then you need to end up breathing all the time through your mouth. If you're getting obstructed in your nose all the time. Why? Because most of these people, what they have is also an intestinal problem. When they have a gastric and an intestinal problem, if you have a wrong stomach, you're gonna get reflux. When you get reflux at night, even though if you don't feel it, you're going to have at night more irritation of your upper respiratory system. And you're going to have more irritation in your nose, in your throat, and then you're going to be producing a lot of inflammation and a lot of phlegm during the day. This causes a lot of problems. Also, remember, that all the lymphatic tissues in the body are interconnected. Why am I saying this? If you have chronic gastritis, or if you have a bad intestinal lining, what we call higher intestinal permeability, because the intestine always has to be permeable, always. But when it's higher than normal, because it's damaged, then it's not no longer permeable to normal regular things and now it's permeable to normal regular things and other things when you're getting there is that you're getting inflammation in the intestinal lining in the immune system in, in your intestine which holds up to 70 percent of our immune system and it's going to be related 
with your respiratory system. That's what, what is called the intestine long axis. That's what it's called. We have relation intestine with the skin. We have connections in between the intestine with all the organs in the body, especially with all those organs that have a mucus or that have a lymphatic connection. But the relationship in between the intestine and all the lymphatics and all the respiratory system has been widely demonstrated. That's why sometimes when people swallow something and they are allergic, they trigger an allergy in the respiratory system. In that way, it could be a mild inflammation coming from the intestine, coming from the reflux, and then chronically affecting all the respiratory system. So first of all, see if you have any of these conditions. If you have any of these conditions, you need to fix them. When you lower inflammation, when you fix heartburn, or when you fix reflux, even though you're asymptomatic, after that, you can go and see what is wrong. It's like figure out when you have, when something is burning, you need to stop the fire, and then you have to go and fix what was burned. But not just go and fix what is being burned without stopping the fire, because then it would be dumb. You need to make both things. Also, you need to see how is stress. When people are more stressed, they get more inflamed, but also they stop all the appropriate physiology of the stomach, and they're gonna be more prone of getting reflux. So when people go to bed and they are stressed, they're going to have more reflux during the day, during the night, and everything is going to go all the way that I just mentioned. Also, stress is something that is going to alter the stomach, it's going to alter the microbiota, it's going to make the intestine more permeable. Then you need to be focusing on managing stress. Also, of course, you need to evaluate that people's diet. If their diet is wrong, if you're altering your stomach, if you're altering your intestinal lining, if you're inflaming your body by the bad choices that you are making in your diet, then nothing is going to work. You can get any discongestant you want, you can get all the inhalers, all the medications, you can go even to surgery. Nothing is going to happen unless you change your stress, unless you change your diet, unless you fix your stomach and your gut. And the last thing is, of course, go and check how is the nasal congestion? If you need a discongestion while you're fixing all those things, of course, we're in the 21st century. We need to go and get the things that are going to help us because this is something that we need to be addressing and we need to be talking about, especially when you observe it in kids because the problems after years of having this are going to be very severe. So the thing is, this is something that it's important. This is something that we really need to pay attention. The best way that we can do it, that we can see it and that we can fix it is by first recognizing, two, seeing after these things that I just mentioned and go and talk to your physician and go and see how you can work with them, with, with your physician, how you can work together in order that you can have all these tools tools and make them at home and then you can start evaluating how these things are getting better because then the complications if you don't do it are going to be very severe. Please remember that the best way that we can create community is by sharing the videos and letting people know that you can be the owner of your health which is the only purpose of this channel. And also before you leave please remember to hit the like button, subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so and also click the bell so every time we make new videos you're going to be the first one to get notified. Thank you until next time.